So, good morning, everybody. Martin and Esther, if you want, you can come on. We are very happy to welcome you in REN for this uh, sixth uh, ECMM course on medical mycology. And uh, first, some words on REN and Brittany. Here you can see the map of Europe, of course, and you can see where we are in the western part of France. And in Rennes, for those who arrived yesterday, you can see that it is a, a very old city. Yesterday it was really crowded because of the music day, but it was uh, very, very nice. If you have some time, so then you can go also to the north of uh, Brittany with the marvelous Mont Saint-Michel, you probably know, but also Saint-Malo, as you can see, on the seaside. And in the south, this is not Polynesia, this is not Tahiti, this is Golf du Morbihan. It is a really, really uh, wonderful uh, uh, part of uh, Brittany. But uh, the water is not so warm. Huh? It's, it's a little bit cold. So if you want, you can go and visit this marvelous uh, uh, region. Here in Rennes, so I'm uh, the head of the parasitology mycology ward. It, it is a teaching uh, hospital. We are now a CMM Excellent Center and also National Reference Center for Chronic Pulmonary Aspergillosis. And there is a research institute, that is Institut de Recherche en Santé, Environment, Travail, Environment, Work and Health. And uh, our uh, research institute is leading a French national initiative called France Exposome. So, Exposome, why? Because uh, of course, you know that we live in the complex uh, with a complex host fungi interplay uh, with expo environmental exposure and exposure to fungi and also host factors. And that leads to chronic disease, to invasive disease, to allergy. And the concepts of hologenome and exposome are uh, presented here. Here you have the hologenome with the whole genome. That means human genome, but also microbial genome but also my uh, mobile home. And what is exposome? Exposome is this holobiome, holobiome sorry, with also environmental exposure and uh, also toxic and chemicals. So today the topic will be the exposome and health issues. And the board of ECMM is very happy to welcome you. Here you can see Professor Esther Segal, that is treasurer of um, ECMM. Professor Martin Honigel, president of ECMM, and you can see here a photo of the council meeting. And I can give you uh, the microphone for a few words. Thank you. Good morning to all. I am very happy to be here. Uh, many, many years ago, I was visiting Britannia, but just the north. And so this is new. I love traveling. And uh, this is from what I s saw yesterday evening. I came in yesterday. It is a very lively city, at least judging what, what happened yesterday. I am sure it's not every day, but <laughs> the people look happy enough. And uh, I, I am thankful to Jean-Pierre, my colleague here, uh, for showing us some of the places. Uh, just for a few minutes, but we got the idea what Ren can can give in in terms of uh, an important and worthy place to see. So we are. I'm happy to be here, and from what I saw till now, it will be a very good educational symposium. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. So also welcome from my side um, on behalf of the ECMM. Unfortunately, I arrived a little bit late, so I'm sorry for my outfit. It's kind of like coming directly from the train. Um, and I have not experienced rain so far, it, except for this morning where I had this after smell after the party when I'm walking through the city. <laughs> but it looks very beautiful, so I'm looking forward to spend time here with Jean-Pierre and also in the surrounding. Um, and yes, with that, I think it's great to have an in-person um, ECMM symposium again. It's qu just quite a time that we had it. Last time, I think it was in Tel Aviv. Now, maybe six, four, years five, four years ago, because two years ago it was a virtual event. 
um, in Romania. So it's very good to meet everyone in person at this meeting. And thanks so much, Jean-Pierre, for you know, making all this work and organizing, I think, a wonderful program and very much looking forward to the program in the next two days. Thank you. OK, so thank you. Here you can see that we are not alone because we are online with more than 170 people from every continent mainly for, from Europe, but also Asia, Africa, and South America. And now we are going to start. But before, I want to, to thank Congress Care, who, uh, who is with us uh, for the organization of uh, this uh, course, and also uh, our sponsors. You can see here, Shionogi, IMI, Fongitel, Patonostics, and Dundress. So we are going to start with uh, three inaugural uh, conferences. One ECMM um, under the auspice of ECMM, the second one under the auspice of ISHAM, and the third one under the auspice of the French Society for Medical Mycology. And Martin, we start with you, medical mycology and climate change. So for the speakers, you have to stay here because there is the, the camera just in front between the two screens. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you. Um, Jean-Pierre, can I yeah. thank you for the slides? <laughs> So, let me jump into this. Um, so for the next 30 minutes, I want to talk about medical mycology and climate change. Um, and these are the, my disclosures. Oh. OK, perfect. Makes sense. Makes, makes things easier and maybe the sound cleaner. OK, let's start. So what about climate change? I think climate change is a very important topic for medical mycology. Um, and it has probably also been a very important um, topic in the past, where um, fungal, fungi and, 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 and fungal pathogens may have played a role, according to this theory, um, in basically predisposing or basically helping um, us mammals and then later on humans to, be, to be, become this important, um, to, have to, be, to get this important role in life. So we know that fungi like it colder than we are, um, and that's why reptiles, unfortunately, who have a lot of advances um, again, advantages against mammals, because they have a much lower body temperature, they don't need to eat all the time to keep the, the body temperature high, they don't need to nurse the children, so lots of survival benefits that reptiles may have, but they are colder, which may really um, have predisposed them to a large extent to fungal infections. And maybe have played a role why at one point the reptiles kind of like disappeared and then reappeared, but the mammals really took over in ruling the world. And when looking into fungal pathogens and kind of like taking into account what is the temperature that optimally saves you against a fungal infection, but at the same time does not require too much work, too much eating to keep it up, we come to basically pretty much our body temperature. So we are kind of like out of our body temperature is, or I will see you later, maybe has been in some time in the future, really the optimal scenario in saving us um, from fungal infections. And that was in the past, so we have to be very thankful to fungal pathogens that made us who we are basically in the world um, and helped us to um, basically strive um, as mammals. And of course, have to be thankful for the other, for the other positive um, things um, fungi are doing to us, including um, you know, providing us with beer, cleaning up the woods, etc., and antibiotics. Um, when we look into the present, of course, all of this comes together and playing a role in explaining why fungi are still not posing a bigger threat to us human. They are ubiquitous in the, in the, in the environment um, um, and are also, of course, constituents of the human microbiome. But really of the estimated 5 million, and it's getting more every, so don't learn this number, basically, um, species of fungi around the world, only 300 cause disease regularly in humans. And really the most important reason, besides other reasons like our immune system, etc., of course, are that fungi um, do not grow well at the human body temperature. So what would happen if we were colder? Like, for example, these bats, you may argue, bats are not colder than we are, but if they are sleeping, of course, in winter, they get very cold, and that's the time when they are prone to develop um, fungal infections. 
And there's, for example, this um, fungus, Pseudogymnastus destructans, a very threatening name. And indeed, um, this fungus is causing the white nose syndrome that really affects bats in North America and is responsible for over 6 million um, de 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 death of bats in North America. In some caves where this um, fungus is in, um, over 90% of all bats are extinct. Luckily for us, these fungal spores can only survive at colder temperatures, so they won't currently be able to infect the human. And some more some closer example, um, you have, of course, um, frogs and also salamanders um, also in Europe. Um, and they are infected by chytridiomycosis um, caused by the chytrid fungus, um, which is really capable um, to cause sporadic death in, in some amphibian population, while in others it's causing up to 100% mortality rates. And it really has been implicated, um, this disease, in mass die-off and even species extinctions in frogs since the 1990s. And uh, for as example, for Europe, from the Netherlands, actually, where we do have some participation here as well, um, Bacchardotrydum salamandrivorans, um, which um, has led to a 96% um, reduction in um, salamander population since 2010 in the Netherlands. Luckily also, when you look at the temperatures, also this fungus is more likely to survive at temperatures 17 to 25 degrees. So still kind of like we have a little bit of gap with our body temperature um, for um, this fungus not to become threatening to us. And then of course we have, um, you know, television and series and um, maybe, you know, one of the biggest attention um, um, spending um, events over the last year, uh, years, which was the series The Last of Us, which is about this cordyceps fungus, which we have heard of now for a while as a fungus that's quite sophisticated and can infect basically um, ants and can kind of like maneuver the ants that they climb to the highest end of a tree from where they die and then kind of like spread the spores of the fungus to um, other ants. And the theory here is, of course, that, you know, this fungus will learn to adapt to humans. But this is, of course, a far-fetched theory. And I will not spend my talk in trying to convince you that this is an actual scenario that's real. But I think what's important to say, while this is not real, it's definitely real that fungal infections are becoming a bigger threat. And there's numerous reasons for that. What I highlight here, basically, is, of course, the advances in medicine. So the better we are doing in treating underlying diseases, with every advance in medicine, and this is really continuing, of course, intensive care units were a big advance, organ transplant were a big advance, um, stem cell transplant were a big advance. But if we look more recently, small molecule therapy, um, et cetera. So this is really kind of like continuing um, that medically um, um, prospering and, and, and advances in, in, in medicine um, are occurring, and with that, we have this increasing number um, of fungal infections. So currently, we are dealing with an estimate of about 50 million cases of pulmonary and invasive fungal infections um, per year. Um, and of course, what we are always seeing with fungal infections is that there is a shift from the typically at risk patients to other um, risk groups. And that's of course because, you know, we in these highest risk patients, we often use in the meantime antifungal prophylaxis, which is reducing the number of fungal infections there, while other risk groups are emerging where we don't have the evidence yet to use antifungal prophylaxis um, and therefore um, have more fungal infections. But I think what's important to say here, and that's of course also displayed in this graph, is, you know, what Gia Thompson had in this famous um, Twitter, Twitter quote, I think fungi are really becoming superbugs. I think they're really the ones that are going to be problematic over the next decade, and the battle is sort of just beginning. And the reason for that is not only the advances in medicine, but I want to convince you that also um, climate change and kind of like how the world develops um, is playing a major role there. So these are the numbers that we are currently dealing with. I think I will just walk over. You're aware of that. We have candidiasis, aspergillosis as the most um, common invasive fungal diseases in most parts of Europe um, in the United States. But we are still not good, and that's kind of like important to emphasize um, in diagnosing um, especially mucomycosis and often only find it at autopsy. Now the main topic of my talk, basically, and this is really um, dealing with the future, and some of this future you will see is now. I will start with some good news, and then unfortunately it's mostly bad news. The good news is, of course, that we currently, for the first time, I think, for the first, I would not say for the first time ever, because I think 25 years ago, there was also a lot of development with new antifungals coming um, on the market, but I think it's at least as exciting now with a number of new antifungal drug classes being in late-stage clinical development, and I think we will hear um, 
this afternoon more about olorafim, one of these new drug classes that's um, very effective against molds, some rare molds with the exception of mucoralis, but definitely a drug we're looking forward to, and also against endemic mycosis, which of course will have a topic over the next slide um, in, my, um, in my talk on climate change. But we have also other classes that are, you know, about to become available um, and new drug formulations of existing classes that bring some benefit. So definitely we are doing better in terms of antifungal drugs. But at the same time, we are also living in times of climate change. And we know that um, climate change does have multiple impacts on um, fungal diseases, um, including um, increasing the Dermotolerance, which then secondary um, leads sometimes to an increase in virulence of some fungal pathogens. I will show you some slides about that. Very importantly, increasing the geographic range of particularly the endemic fungal infections that were formerly much more restricted in terms of where they occur and are really broadening now to multiple areas, into much broader areas in the world. Um, Via natural disasters, of course, climate change leads to an increase in natural disasters, thereby increase of host stability. Also, of course, the global warming in certain areas may also lead to an increase of host stability. And via the natural disasters, of course, also to dispersal of fungal pathogens. So they may be dispersed. Um, trauma wounds also, also often, of course, a result of natural disasters that may predispose um, also immunocompetent people to um, develop fungal infections. I will start a little bit with um, the um, geographic spread, basically, um, and with coccidioidomycosis. This may not be super relevant here in Europe, except for people who come back, basically, from traveling in the United States. But I remember, kind of like, when reading the literature 20 or 30 years ago, this was really a disease that was based, kind of like, in the Central Valley, Arizona, Nevada. So it was very, very well described the relatively small region of the United States where coccidioidomycosis was occurring. And this is unfortunately now really spreading over all western United States um, due to kind of like the global warming and also the lack of, um, of course, precipitation. And you can see here basically with this map um, um, where um, the thresholds of about, you know, how much rain is a year and the, and the temperature um, basically is modeled over the um, um, next decades. Um, and what you can see here is basically in, in, I don't know if I have a pointer here, but in, in pink here is basically, that means both thresholds for coccidioidomycosis are met. And more or less, with very few exceptions, you can see um, coccidioidomycosis by 2065 and 2095 will occur in all the western um, part of the United States, really kind of like affecting all the areas there. And I can tell you even now, when it, where we are heading now, it's already the most important fungal infection in many places, like also Southern California, where it's full clinics just with coccidioidomycosis patients. Histoplasmosis, something where we get a little bit more closer to Europe, although this example is still far away. Um, Acapulco, Mexico, um, you all remember this outbreak, spring break 2001, more than 200 American college students um, with pulmonary symptoms um, after returning from spring break in Acapulco to the United States. And then the CDC came basically to investigate this. All these students have been in the same hotel in Acapulco. And the risk factor was the frequent use of the staircase, so presumably less alcohol consumption um, because people could still walk the staircases. But unfortunately, they passed these um, potted flowers um, and they, in, in, in the basically in the, in the potting soil, um, they found histoplasmosis. And just by passing these flowers, basically, this was enough for 200 otherwise healthy college students to become sick um, when they returned um, to, the, to the United States. So really something that's, um, you know, a, a disease of importance in terms of not necessarily killing you, but in, in terms of kind of like affecting all of us potentially. Um, and when we look into the estimated areas with histoplasmosis and how they have expanded, of course, we have basically the second part of the United States, all the eastern part, but this is really going down to Mexico, all Latin America, Africa, um, parts of Asia, and you can see here, of course, also autochthonous cases that are in the meantime described in Europe. So this is clearly also an endemic mycosis that is spreading um, um, over with the world uh, getting a warmer place, and that become, will become much more important um, in Europe, um, also in non-travelers um, over the next um, years and decades. So when you think about um, 
the next part, which is really the germ tolerance, um, and then in part how it is interacting with viral lens. I think the main statement we have to do here is that fungi were in the world long before us, basically, and they will very likely be in the world long be be after us because they are just much better in adapting to new conditions than we are um, as mammals, humans. And um, one of the things they are doing now with the world is getting warmer. They, are, they have several mechanisms, and I just showed here a few, how fungi basically adapt to the warmer, de temp to the warmer temperatures. And this can go through, for example, increased production of detoxifying enzymes and protein, um, stabilizing metabolites, also through um, cell wall thickening and remodeling, um, as well as increased melanin production, um, and also pro nutrient utilization, which all make, and you can of course argue, these are all kind of like have the potential to make the pathogens more virulent, to make the pathogens more threatening. And um, that's also the theory behind that, that you know, this adaption leads to basically enhanced virulence and immune evasion um, by, of course, for example, enhanced resistance to oxidative stress, to pH stress, UV stress, obviously, um, but potentially also antifungal drug stress. Um, and I'll show you the example how I make this connection on the next slide. Enhanced biofilm formation, um, um, also changes in dimorphism if this brings the benefit of the fungus basically to survive and adapt to the temperature. And as an example, as a practical example for um, thermal tolerance, of course, we can talk about Cryptococcus deuterogatii, which is really a species within the Cryptococcus gattii um, complex um, that has much higher levels of thermal tolerance than other Cryptococcus um, gattii complex members. And it's really an emerging pathogen um, for both humans and animals um, with spreads um, up to you know, British Columbia, Canada, but also in the you know, neighboring um, states in the United States, Washington, Oregon. And how thermal tolerance may then um, increase virulence, there's really some good examples um, in plant pathogens, in fungal plant pathogens, for example, Fusarium graminearum, where um, the production of mycotoxins um, increases with high, te uh, high temperature and water stress. And also Boxenia striformis, um, which has adapted to high temperatures, and then basically um, the new strains that have adapted, that became thermotolerant, um, are more aggressive um, and replace the old strains um, by spreading also to new regions. And of course, you may say these are, these are bland fungal pathogens, but Everything is connected, and that's kind of like the important thing about um, climate change. And that's the problem, you know, with more viral and plant pathogens, which then lead to increased usage of broad spectrum antifungals in agriculture, emergence of resistance in plant pathogens, and then something we'll hear about the, uh, probably in the afternoon the utilization of reserve antifungals in agriculture that are similar to novel antifungals, that are basically components of novel antifungal classes in humans, because the approval is much easier to get this approved in animals, versus, uh, in plants versus humans, of course. So it kind of like leads to this scenario where um, we have basically new antifungals first um, for um, plants, um, then we have them for humans, and by the way, we use them in humans may already have kind of like some resistance that is triggered by the usage in agriculture. And of course, all of this um, further um, do further um, increase of resistance um, problems in humans. And that's only, of course, one part. The other part is, of course, the food crisis. And the problem, as you know, with these pathogens, of course, um, worldwide, um, people are dying because they don't have enough food, right? So that's kind of like the other part, right? Of course, it's hard to argue we don't, we need antifungals to kind of like ensure food supply um, and crop supply. Um, but of course, it has also the detrimental effect um, in our world where we are not threatened by lack of food supply, but more threatened by resistant fungal infections. And of course, azo resistance, you know, one of the examples, but that's definitely something that will keep us busy um, over the next um, years and decades. The increased use of broad spectrum new antifungals in agriculture, um, but which may really trigger um, also resistance rates, even against new antifungals. Um, and that's definitely something we have to keep an eye on, eye on and be very vigilant about. And last but not least, I have said, you know, the future is now. And of course, we can also argue that climate change um, had a big um, um, impact on 
maybe the most urgent um, 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 emergence of a new um, fungal pathogens, which is the emerging, emergence of um, Candida auris. And especially when seeing here, you know, people from the United Kingdom, where this is already a global health crisis. We don't have probably, we have in, a, in, in the audience, people from India and the United States, where this is also a big health crisis. This is really something um, that is um, keeping us busy. Um, and not to the same extent every country, but nevertheless a threat. Um, and we, the theory behind this, and this is complicated, of course, it was not only climate change. It may also have been the, you know, the expansion of agriculture into kind of like these wetlands um, that may have contributed, but also the adaption that has been shown, basically, there are Candida auris isolates, which are not as thermotolerant that can be found. And this, there's really the theory that Candida auris over time became more thermotolerant up to the extent where it could cause um, infections in humans. Um, and um, then basically came to the agriculture, then to the cities and the hospitals and spread around the world. And how dramatic this spread is, I can show you with this map example with Canada Auris outbreaks up to 2017. Um, you see kind of like certain places um, around the world where this was reported. But of course, already 2021, the world looked um, different with all, all countries in blue um, having some Canada Auris um, reported. And in the meantime, the world has gone bluer even um, when we use the ECBM blue. So definitely, you know, something that's spreading around the world. Also during COVID, where we had multiple outbreaks um, also of Candida auris um, across the world. Um, and of course, when thinking about these outbreaks, for all of you who have dealt with this, they are very much aware. These are really um, ICU outbreaks that we were not used from fungal pathogens because they get Candida auris gets transmitted mostly via health personnel from patient to patient bed and from room to room in the ICU. You can see here such an example where you see all the rooms with Candida auris basically marked. So management is really um, complicated, um, also because patients are often colonized indefinitely. So it's really hard basically to dec decolonize patients. Um, also, some of the disinfectants are not as effective against um, Candida auris. Um, and that, of course, results in patients coming from the ICU, colonized with Candida auris, then um, if they survive um, to um, retired homes, etc., where this may be spread, where the spread may continue. So really a big challenge um, for um, hospitals and infection control. Um, and luckily, I think, you know, we can say, and hopefully this stays the way, that some countries in Europe have kind of like, are currently still kind of like surviving this, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, it, it will always be the case where this is getting worse. But some countries only have isolated cases of Canada Auris, and they keep it isolated. And that's kind of like what we all need to focus on and um, really try to ha make happen. If we have a Canada Auris case, it should be, be a single Canada Auris case, and it should not be an outbreak. Um, I think it's possible, but of course, with times and with the spread of the organism, um, you know, outbreaks will occur everywhere at some point. Important, of course, is first, um, first of all, the rapid identification of colonized infected patients. Um, basically, then tr avoid and, and prevent transmission, multiple measures that can be, um, and I won't go through them in detail, environmental disinfection, which can be complicated because certain kind of um, 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 disinfectants have to be used, hand hygiene procedures, um, and then, of course, last but not least, the decolonization procedures. So really very complicated um, management um, in terms of infection control to keep these um, occurrences of Canada hours under control and prevent um, ICU outbreaks. Last but not least, and this is kind of like going a little bit beyond climate change, and we don't have the hard evidence for that, but we also, of course, have other resistant um, Canada species that are now increasingly causing outbreaks in ICUs, just mentioning here um, Canada barbsilosis, um, fluconazole resistant Canada barbsilosis, which is clearly spreading. So this um, brings me really to my take home messages, um, which is um, that climate change will likely result in a further increase of fungal infection prevalence as it alters the attributes of the fungus, um, leading to thermotolerance and increased virulence. It alters, of course, um, the host because we are not as well adapted to the increasing temperatures and increases um, the host sensibility and, of course, also the host environment, um, including the geographic range um, where these fungal um, um, pathogens um, may um, occur. And with that, I want to, of course, all invite you to our big conference um, that will come up in October in Athens. Um, and, you know, I think it's a perfect 
partnering basically to have this really science-focused ECMM Educational Symposium, which is always a highlight. So thanks for you all being here. And then, of course, we have the big DIM conference, which is also science-focused, but a much broader classical fo the conference in the field of mycology. And I hope to see you all there. And with that, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Martin, for this fantastic uh, conference. So perhaps one burning question regarding climate change. <laughs> And then we have. No. <laughs> so uh, we can have questions after the three conferences. Because now we have to move uh, to the um, next conference from uh, Professor Ahmed Fahl. Professor Ahmed Fahl is one of the experts in the world on uh, mycetoma. Uh, it will be um, uh, a PowerPoint uh, uh, that we that we'll see. He's working in Sudan. Uh, he's a WHO um, collaborative center, and so tell me if it's possible to have the PowerPoint. It doesn't work. There's a problem, a ne technical problem. So I think we can move to Jacques, uh, Professor Jacques Guillot. The next one, the third one. Ah, ah no, it's okay. It's okay. This is my Setoma Research Center. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Professor Fahal. I am a professor of surgery, University of Khartoum, the Mycetoma Research Center, Sudan. I am going to talk about mycetoma, the challenges that face us dealing with mycetoma patients and research, and the opportunities to rectify these challenges and difficulties. The main objective of this presentation is to share our experience on mycetoma as a neglected medical and health problem globally. The other important objective is to identify the challenges, the difficulties, the constraints, and the opportunities to help in rectifying these problems. For those who may not be able to stay to the end of this presentation, I'm going to conclude my talk by saying mycetoma is a serious health and medical problem. It is one of the badly neglected conditions globally, as it is not a glorious disease. Currently, the available medical treatment, the diagnostic test, have many shortcomings and constraints. The treatment is suboptimal, and currently there is no control or preventive program for mycetoma patients. And our job it is to correct that, as it is not a glorious disease. Another important conclusion I am going to conclude my talk by saying. Mycetoma is a scar on the human consciousness. And our job is to heal it, as it is a non-glorious disease. I declare no conflict of interest in this presentation. All photos, images, will going to be shown in this presentation were taken after a written informed consent. This presentation is based on our experience at the Mycetoma Research Center, Khartoum, Sudan, on more than 9,000 patients with confirmed mycetoma. I would like to invite you for a virtual visit to the Mycetoma Research Center. Research Center was established in 1991 under the umbrella of the University of Khartoum in Sudan. 
It was set up at Sober University Hospital to provide integrated high quality medical care for mycetoma patients, superb research, excellent education, teaching and training in the various aspects of mycetoma and exceptional community development activities. Ladies and gentlemen, mycetoma is one of the badly neglected tropical disease. In fact, it is a unique neglected tropical disease. And I'm going to show you in a minute why it is a unique neglected tropical disease. It is a devastating medical dilemma as seen in this patient with intracranial spread. Mycetoma, it is a shattering medical problem. It can be a very mutilating problem as seen in this young gentleman with a massive actanomycetoma of the hand that ended in an amputation. It can be a disfiguring problem and it can be a disabling and dysfunctioning problem. More than 70 microorganisms were reported to cause mycetoma. They are of fungal and bacterial origin. The fungal type of mycetoma, the eomycetoma, is caused by a group of true fungi. Madrella and Leptospira are the commonest organism causing eomycetoma globally. At the Mycetoma Research Center, we managed to isolate three new causative organisms for mycetoma. Madrella fahali was one of them. This is the second new causative organism causing mycetoma. And this is the third type of organism causing mycetoma. Currently, we are working on three new organisms causing eomycetoma to be reported for the first time. For the actinomycetoma, the bacterial type, Streptomyces somaliensis, Streptomyces sudaniensis, Actinomadura maduri, Actinomadura pelletirii, and Nocardia are the commonest causative organism. It is interesting to note, although the actinomycetoma and the eomycetoma are caused by different organisms, but they have the same clinical presentation. And the cause is not well understood. Probably shared characteristics of the organisms may be the cause of the same clinical presentation. Presently, the incidence and the prevalence of mycetoma globally are not well known and characterized because it is a badly neglected problem. Mycetoma commonly seen in tropical and subtropical regions and that include Sudan, Somalia, Senegal, South America, Mexico, India, and other countries in the belt. And the belt is called the mycetoma belt. And this is the latest WHO mapping of mycetoma globally. The prevalence of mycetoma differ from one region to the other region, depending on the number of cases reported. Still, there is some doubt about the route of infection of mycetoma. The most popular theory that the microorganisms within the grains are shed into the soil, and in the soil they found a suitable environment for them to grow and to have the infected form, and they, they are implanted into the subcutaneous tissue of the human being. Probably there is an intermediate host, but we are not sure what is this intermediate host. It can be an insect, it can be a son, it can be a sharp object. And again, not every individual 
in the infected areas may develop the infection. And that may be to many other causes. Traumatic implantation of the causative organism into the subcutaneous tissue is the most popular theory for the root of infection. We found in some soil the organisms embedded within the soil. And this may support the implantation traumatic theory for the root of infection. As I mentioned, not every individual in endemic areas may develop mycetoma, and there is multifactorial factors for that. It can be environmental, it can be genetically determined, or it can be immunogenic predisposition. This is the typical environment for mycetoma to grow and to develop. Poor hygienic situation, contact with the animal, the animal dunk, dirt, and the sharp objects, and so on. And here we find high incidence of mycetoma in such villages. There is, there is a genetic predisposition for mycetoma as evidence with many cases of mycetoma in certain villages in certain areas in Sudan. No doubt, these patients has many immunogenic problems and that may predispose to development of mycetoma. Mycetoma enjoys all the neglected tropical diseases characteristics. It affects the poor of the poor in poor remote population and communities. Commonly seen in workers working with the soil and the farmers and shepherds. Mycetoma has many socio-economic impacts on patients, families, and communities. No partners, no work, and no education. And in fact, it is considered as a social stigma in certain communities. Most of the mycetoma patients are workers, farmers, but in endemic areas, other people can be affected as well. About 30% of our patients are children and students. And you can see the misery of these young patients when affected by mycetoma. This is to emphasize again about 30% of our patients are children. Males are commonly affected compared to the females. However, at the village, male to female ratio is equal. Probably females are not willing to come to the clinic for consultation and treatment. These patients are of low socioeconomic status and of low health education level. It is interesting to note during pregnancy, the infection will flare up, more sinuses, more discharge, and more disability. And that may be due to the breast immune system during the pregnancy journey. The clinical presentation is typical in many cases. It starts as a small painless lump, gradually increase in size. A sister lump may develop as well, and eventually it will increase in size, leading to massive deformity and destruction of the tissues. Multiple sinuses then develop with discharge, which is a seroperulent or perulent containing different or different grains. The grains can be black, can be white, can be yellow, can be red, of different consistency and different sizes. The inflammatory process is spread 
along the subcutaneous tissue to affect the skin and deep structure. Interesting enough, the tendons and the nerve are rarely affected in mycetoma and the cause is enigma. It can spread by the lymphatics to the regional lymph node where a satellite lesion may develop there. Recently, we found evidence of blood spread in mycetoma. As seen in this slide, a grain of Actanomadura peritei is seen in this slide within intact blood vessel, indicating the blood spread of the infection in this patient. In many patients, the regional lymph nodes are enlarged, and secondary bacterial infection is the cause, or it might be part of the immune response to the infection. But in some cases, it is a genuine spread of the organisms along the lymphatic to the regional lymph node, and you can see here lymph node badly studied with grains of eomycetoma. Mycetoma commonly seen in the hands and the foot, and that account for almost 80% of cases. However, in endemic areas, other parts of the body can be affected. It is interesting to note the right hand is commonly affected than the left hand, and that may indicate a traumatic occupational origin for the infection. Other side can be the inguinal, can be the axilla, can be the breast, or it can be in the eye, in these poor patients. He ended with massive secondary bacterial infection, destruction of the eye, and eye inoculation. It can be seen in the gluteal region, the perineum, the scrotum. In some cases, Different parts of the body may be affected at the same time, as is seen in this patient. The foot, the thigh, inguinal lymph nodes, and the hand. And here, it is difficult to treat such patient. In some patients, multiple organisms of different origin may be isolated. And here, we need to combine the treatment for both eomycetoma and actinomycetoma. The outcome of mycetoma depends on the site, the duration, the size, the causative organism, and the immune response of the patient. No doubt, mycetoma is a disabling problem. It is important and vital to reach a diagnosis so as to plan the proper management for these patients. The diagnosis can be clinically, but that it is not always correct. It may be dangerous as the patient may given the wrong treatment. Always we need to have a solid evidence of the causative organism to the level of the species. And here we may need to have cytology, histological examination for surgical biopsies, grain culture, and grain PCR. Very important, again, to identify and to determine the disease extent. And here, a battery of investigations may be needed. X-ray, ultrasound, MRI, and CT scan. These imaging techniques are mandatory and necessary to determine the extent of the mycetoma along the tissue planes. However, the current diagnostic tools are invasive and expensive. It may be painful, and sometimes we need to go for a surgical excision to collect the appropriate biopsies 
samples to confirm the diagnosis. And here, recurrence may be one of the problem, if not done properly. Presently, the available diagnostic tools have low sensitivity and low specificity. We need to have a combination of tools, techniques, tests to confirm the diagnosis of mycetone. And that may be difficult and may be expensive for the patients and for the community and the health authorities in the affected endemic areas. Currently, there is no point of care test for mycetoma. And this is an important challenge we are facing. It may be an important cause for the delay of the management of mycetoma patients. And some of the important causes for the poor of management, it is the lack of the point of care test at the mycetoma endemic villages as these patients are of low socioeconomic status, health education level, and that may lead to delayed presentation with advanced disease. An important cause for the late presentation is the depend on most of the patients in rural areas on the local traditional treatment. Important cause for the late presentation and the poor management is the road blocks, especially in endemic areas during the rain seasons. And many of the people, they have to use this truck to move from one point to the other point. It is difficult, very difficult for them to reach centers for diagnosis and treatment. Many challenges are facing us during dealing with mycetoma patients. The available cure rate is low. We have a high recurrence rate and we have a high patient dropout from follow-up. And again, that had led to the lack of the effective, safe, affordable treatment for mycetoma patients. Currently, the available treatment for actanomycetoma is a combination of antibiotics and it is curable. However, it takes quite a long time to achieve that. This is one of the patients with actanomycetoma. It started on cotrimixazole amikacin sulfate with a very good response. And the outcome of the treatment was excellent. However, due to low socioeconomic status and health education, she dropped the follow-up and she had a massive recurrence. For the eomycetoma, for quite a long time, the ketoconazole was the drug of choice. However, ketoconazole has many side effects. Hypersensitivity reaction, lips ulceration, hyperpigmentation of the skin, adrenal insufficiency, gynecomastia, had led to the FDA and the European Medicine Agency to recommend stopping use this drug due to its side effect. Many patients respond to medical treatment. But it is difficult to say who is going to respond and who is not, and when going to respond. We noticed in patients with renal transplant, the recurrence of mycetoma is high. In many patients, the organisms are viable within the capsules, and there's a high recurrence rate. Hence, the available treatment for eomycetoma is suboptimal. Sadly, there is nothing on the pipeline for the mycetoma treatment. The surgical excision is always massive, aggressive, and you can see here 
how massive the infection affecting the subcutaneous tissue, badly affecting the bones, and you can see the cavities within the bones after curettage. And the excision may be very massive as is seen in this patient where you can see through the tissues. It ends like this. Again, it is not very bright outcome of this patient. This is another example of a very massive mycetoma of the chest wall, anterior, lateral, and posterior, abdominal wall as well. He had treatment for three years, and then he had a white local excision and skin graft, and I can see this is a very reasonable outcome for this patient. This is another example of a patient with very massive mastoma of the perineum, the gluteal, the scrotum, and the inguinal region. He spent about three years in hospital. He had more than 40 surgical operations with a colostomy, and he had a very good outcome. However, he developed a massive recurrence after all these treatments. In developing countries, amputation is a social stigma. It is a deformative, and you can see how massive the amputation can be in such patients. Amputation in developing countries may put the patient at the end of his career. This is an example of a patient with a very massive knee mycetoma, EU mycetoma, evidenced by X-rays and MRI. He had a white local excision, had a spread to the inguinal region, and once he came to the clinic coughing, coughing the black grains, and the chest x-ray showed multiple secondaries, and the CT scan again showed a massive secondaries in both sides. He died from severe sepsis and septicemia and chest infection. Another poor example of the management of mycetoma, this patient who had a massive gluteal mycetoma for which he had a multiple surgical incision, this articulation, he had spread into the pelvis and then has spread to the chest. And you can see how massive the intra-abdominal spread of the mycetoma in this patient. This gentleman, he presented to the outpatient clinic, coughing of the black grains. And the lab confirmed these grains are grains of Madurella mycetomatus. And the chest CT showed a massive pleural effusion. And again, this patient died from severe septicemia and chest infection. The challenges for mycetoma patients' care and treatment are many. We need urgently an effective drug, a good diagnostic test, and a plan for a good prevention. No doubt, a good diagnostic test is needed, simple, available, field-friendly, and can be used anywhere. We need to have a plan, objective plan to prevent mastoma patients from developing the disease. And again, this is important. The good news about mastoma, it is now, it is one of the neglected tropical disease included after the recommendation of the World Health Assembly in 2016. And now it is start to gain some awareness globally. And now many medical and health institutes and research started to be interested to work together on mycetoma. And we have now the Global Mycetoma Working Group. The good news, at the Mycetoma Research Center, we conducted the first 
double blind clinical trial and the results obtained are very promising. Many young researchers now are started to be much involved in the mycetoma research and management of patients. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. I don't know if Professor Ahmad Fahal is uh, online. No. Okay. But um, this meeting is registered. So what I, can I say is that I was uh, lucky enough to meet him at uh, Geneva during the last uh, skin neglected tropical disease uh, uh, meeting uh, organized by the WHO. And I was really, really impressed by his uh, presentation. I think he has a huge unique, incredible experience on mycetoma. And um, we are today lucky to, to have uh, this uh, presentation. So now I propose to move to the third inaugural conference with Professor Guillot, Jacques Guillot, who is a professor of, uh, medical, uh, of uh, veterinary medicine in, uh, in, one, in, in Nantes uh, uh, Veterinary School. And so, yes, of course, we are in the concept of one health. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here today uh, with you and all the people uh, who are looking at us uh, via the visual conference. So thank you very much to Jean-Pierre and all the organizing committee of the ECMM uh, Symposium. Thank you also to the, the French Society of uh, Medical Mycology and, and Françoise Botrel. Uh, uh, president, a uh, current president. So I will talk uh, today about wild animals. So I think we, we need to have some pictures of cute animals after all these pictures of misetomas, It's quite uh, different subject, <laughs> but... Uh, um, People will dream about uh, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the title of my presentation would be An Expected Reservoir of Pathogenic uh, Fungi. Uh, so I, I'm working in, in a vet... Uh, College in, in Nantes, another city not very far from, from Rennes. I'm also a member of the research group who is located in Angers, another city not very far from, from Rennes in Western France. And I made this presentation with Pascal Arnay, uh, a colleague from the, the French, uh, another uh, French veterinary college and a member of Dynamic uh, Group. So I have no uh, disclosure for the subject of this presentation. And I, I first would like to, to come back to the, the concept of reservoir, because if you look carefully at the program of this symposium, you can see that the word reservoir has been used quite a, a, a lot of time in this, uh, in this symposium. Just So that's normal, but I think it's, it's quite necessary to come back to this concept. Uh, and probably most of you, they don't have exactly the same idea of what we can call a reservoir. So if you look at the literature, you will find, um, doesn't work, yes. So you, you, you will find uh, a conflicting and often incomplete concept about what constitutes a disease reservoir. So you will maybe think about uh, infections in, in reservoir host or always non-pathogenic, which is not really true. Uh, any natural host is a reservoir host, so it's maybe a too large definition of what we can say about reservoir. Reservoir uh, comprise only one species. This is not true. There is usually several uh, different species that can act as reservoir. And you can see also that an ecological system may act uh, as a reservoir. Uh, there was a very nice paper about 20 years ago uh, defining the concept of disease reservoir. Uh, it was published uh, by um, Daniel Aiden and, and collaborators. And according to this very nice analysis, reservoir and infections are one or more epidemiological populations, connected populations, 
uh, or environment, so it's a very large definition, in which the pathogen can be permanently uh, maintained. And this is the most important word in this definition, the, the, the possibility of a permanent maintenance in, inside this reservoir. And of course, the reservoir uh, is a source of infection for the target population, and uh, we are going to, to speak about humans as target population in the, in the following um, in the following slides. So if you look at the paper, you will see this uh, quite complex um, figure with uh, a lot of possibility of uh, transmission from the reservoir to the target um, population. The target population is the gray circle. And you can see that there are two type of host, of population, uh, host population uh, for potential reservoir. So you have the non maintenance population with the small size, and you also have, with the squares, uh, the, the maintenance population with the high size, a size uh, higher than the critical community. And then there are several possibilities. The most simple one is this one, the A, with only uh, one uh, population reservoir and one target host. But you can see that there are many other combinations, and sometimes there they might be different non-maintenance populations, but there is a kind of, of balance between these uh, different populations, and this is enough to maintain the, the pathogen. So what about the transmission of fungal organisms, fungal pathogens? So here you have quite a complex uh, presentation of the, the vast diversity of fungal organisms. Uh, so as... Uh, has been uh, reminded just before, uh, there are millions of fungal organisms, but only a few, about 300, are really important and, and might be pathogenic for humans or, or vertebrates. Uh, so here you have the, the different name of the group of fungal uh, organisms, and when it is written in red, it means that this group is including uh, pathogenic uh, organisms. So you see that the, the presence of pathogenic organisms is, is spread all over the, the, the tree of fungal organisms. And where do pathogenic uh, fungi live? Uh, a lot, most of them, are able to, to live and develop in the environment. Of course, some of them are also able to develop uh, in animals and also, of course, in, in humans. The next question is, are, are all these uh, human pathogenic uh, organisms are transmitted to humans. So there are different strategies. Um, the, the, the most simple one is that the fungal organism is just transmitted from humans to, to humans. So we have the example of pneumocystis, we have the example of malassezia, we have the example of, of candida yeast, which are usually transmitted directly from humans to, to, to humans. We have also uh, animal-specific organisms, which are specifically transmitted from animals to animals. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, the, the bat white nose syndrome with uh, pseudogymnoascus destructans is transmitted only from bats to bats. Um, coming back to, to human uh, pathogens, so we have a very few examples of zoonotic transmission of fungal pathogens. Uh, if you look carefully on, on the tree, you will be uh, able to find only two examples of true zoonotic transmission uh, with a direct implication of animals to humans. So the, the two examples are for zoophilic dermatophytes and also for uh, the species uh, whose name is Portrix brasiliensis. So I saw on the map presented by Jean-Pierre that we have quite a lot of Brazilian colleagues, and especially from the place where there is a specific problem now of spiritual causes, and uh, the, the animal species responsible for that is, is the cats. So in, in South America, especially in, in Brazil, uh, a lot, a lot of, of cases of zoonotic spiritual causes are now reported. And there is a third situation where animals can be implicated. And this is a very common situation where animals, they, they just look like victims, like humans. So the, the fungal organisms are present in their environment, and then there is a transmission either to animals or to humans. But in fact, if you look carefully at this situation, you may define a fourth one uh, where animals are more directly implicated in the, tra in the transmission. So we, we 
should uh, now modify a little bit this uh, figure and introduce the new representation, the new strategy, uh, where animals are really are much more active in, in the transmission and constitute with their immediate reservoir, with immediate environment, a true and important reservoir for fungal organisms. And this situation is clearly identified with the bats and Histoplasma capsulatum, with bamboo rats and Penicillium thalaromyces marnifei, with rodents, with coccidioides, with emoncia-like fungi, and tattoos in South America with uh, some species of paracoccidioides, and, and probably many other situations where animals are much more actively implicated in the epidemiology of, and the transmission of fungal organisms. And all these organisms um, are dimorphic fungi. These are very strange or specific uh, type of, of, of life for these uh, fungal uh, organisms. Uh, they are present in the environment as molds, but they are also able to develop in warm-blooded uh, animals. And then when they do that, they change completely. The, their morphology, their biology uh, change completely, and they form yeast or yeast-like uh, structures or uh, spherules or large structures like uh, emoncia-like uh, organisms. So I, I will now uh, show you some examples of this dimorphic fungi, and I will show you the importance of animals in the epidemiology of, of transmission of this kind of, of organisms. The first example I, I wanted to to, to show you, to highlight today, is Thalaromyces or Penicillium marnifii, a very nice uh, penicillium-like uh, organism. You can see the, the pictures here. And um, the, this is a typical dimorphic fungi with uh, a mold in the environment and uh, yeast uh, in the tissue. And this is um, a, a kind of, of fungus that is uh, present only in, a specific, in specific regions in the world, in South uh, East Asia, um, many, many cases every, every year, especially in HIV-positive um, people living in rural area. And uh, the association with animal is, is at, at the very beginning of the story of, of the discovery of Thalaromyces marnifei, because the fungus was first isolated in Vietnam in 1976 by two French uh, researchers, and the, the fungus was isolated from the bamboo rat. So you can see here the aspect of this uh, wild animal, large rodents, uh, who are able to, to make burrows in the soil and eat bamboo, so that's why the name is, is bamboo rat. There are three species of bamboo uh, rats, and the, uh, the fungus was first isolated from one of these species. The fungus was further isolated uh, and inoculated to laboratory animals, successfully inoculated to mice and hamsters, and then it was sent to Pasteur Institute in France, where one very famous French mycologist, whose name is Gabriel Segreta, um, studied the fungus and uh, discovered that it was a new species, so he gave the name Penicillium marnifei, and recently the name was changed to Telaromyces marnifei. But what is very interesting is that the first case, the first human case, occurred later, uh, in 1973. So you have the example here of the discovery of a, of a human pathogenic uh, fungus, but the, the, the very beginning of the discovery of the fungus is clearly associated with, the, with, the, with an, an animal. So I told you that there are three uh, bamboo rat species. You have the, the geographic distribution of these species in Southeast Asia. They have more or less the same biology, not exactly the same uh, morphology, but they, they live quite the same. And there are also, also breedings of these kind of animals because the meat of the bamboo rat is highly appreciated by, by Chinese. And the, the a very interesting thing is that the, when you compare the geographic distribution of the free uh, species of bamboo rats, in fact, there is a clear correspondence with the genetic structure of Thalaromyces marnifei. So uh, you can see uh, the distribution of the free species of bamboo rats, and just 
uh, associated to this, you can see the distribution of the free genetic clusters, clades of Thalaromyces marnifii, and uh, you see that cluster one is clearly associated with the distribution of the first species of uh, bamboo rats, cluster two with Rhizomys sinensis, not exactly the same, but there is a good correspondence, and uh, the, the third one is associated with the Rhizomys sumatransis, uh, so the, the third um, bamboo rat species. And uh, this is a, a picture I took for, from a very recent and very nice review about uh, taromycosis published in, in Clinical Microbiology uh, Reviews a few weeks ago. And in this picture, you, you can see that bamboo rats have a central uh, position and are clearly identified as, as the reservoir, the soil, of course, the burrows, and the bamboo rats. All this constitute the, the official reservoir of uh, Talormyces marnifii. So this is the first example. The second example is Histoplasma capsulatum, and maybe more precisely the capsulatum variety of Histoplasma capsulatum. Once more, a dimorphic fun uh, fungus with molds in the environment and yeast in the tissues. Uh, is the, the distribution is, is, is very, very wide, very large. Uh, you can find Histoplasma capsulatum almost everywhere, maybe also in Europe. Uh, it is not present on this map, but we can discuss about the, the presence of histoplasma also in Europe. But the, the main places where the fungus is, is present is, is America, especially North America, where they are very active places. Uh, an estimated number of uh, 500,000 people infected annually, uh, so it's very, very important diseases. And once more, the association with animals has been uh, observed, detected um, quite uh, early in the history. So uh, in 1958, Chester Hammonds, a very famous American mycologist, um, observed a strong association between cases of histoplasmosis and the presence of bats, uh, especially in the attics. Uh, and the attic or the, or the houses or the, the patient with histoplasma uh, capsulatum infection. And then a lot of arguments have been, uh, have been provided to, to demonstrate the link between histoplasma capsulatum and the presence of, of bats. So just um, a single uh, slide about bats, because bats are a very fascinating group of, of animals, uh, a, a, a large number of species. Uh, many, many bats uh, everywhere in the world, more or less. Uh, you, you know, of course, that the, that the main characteristic of this mammal is the ability to fly, uh, the dependency on torpor and hibernation, a long lifespan, considering the small size of the, the animal, and also a gregarious social st structure. So this uh, the, the, the presence of colonies and the possibility to fly is also... Uh, a very interesting uh, characteristic because it may allow the, the spread of, of uh, pathogenic organisms and also the distribution uh, from one bat to another one uh, to another bat because the bats are living very close from, from each other. And they also produce a large amount, these colonies, a large amount of feces and urine, and all these constitute what we call the guano, and the guano is a very good substrate for the development of many, many organisms, including um, histoplasma capsulatum. And there is also some um, um, characteristics about the physiology of bats. So bats, uh, the my mitochondrial physiology is very strange because it has evolved to tolerate oxidative stress involved or incurred uh, during high metabolic flights. And this possibly allowed it tolerance to intracellular pathogens, and histoplasma capsulatum is a typical intracellular uh, pathogen. So I, I told you about the, the guano. The guano is a very, very good substrate for the development of many, many different uh, types of, of fungal organisms, but also bacteria. And there is a very nice uh, paper, recent paper, about the, the, the microbiome of bat guano, and they found a lot, a lot of different um, organisms uh, associated with uh, this uh, very important organic uh, substrate, including, of course, a lot of histoplasma capsulatum uh, organisms. 
And when you look at the genetic diversity of Histoplasma capsulatum, you can, you can see that there are different clades associated to different geographic origin, uh, North America, South America, and, and other parts of the world. And you can find uh, more or less all these clades in, in bats. And people also were able to find new uh, clades uh, specifically associated with bats. And there is this uh, nice paper from Mexico where they find a new clade of Histoplasma capsulatum only in this uh, species of, of bat in, in, in Mexico. And the third example I wanted to, to, to show you today where, with the very strong uh, and importance of animal reservoir is Coxidoides. Uh, Coxidoides uh, is once more a dimorphic fungus. Uh, Martin already mentioned that it is uh, an emerging disease, especially in, in North America, a growing number. The, the distribution of the, the fungus is also increasing, uh, probably linked to the, the climate changes, but also maybe also the distribution, potential distribution of, of reservoir host. Uh, this is the, the typical life cycle of, um, of this kind of, of fungus with um, an environmental phase with uh, filaments and um, uh, the, the formation, the development of, of spherules inside the preliminary uh, tract of, of mammals. This is the distribution of coccidoidea mycosis or valley feather with uh, the specific spot uh, in uh, southwest uh, America, especially California, Arizona, a lot, a lot of cases. And once more, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, this uh, mycologist made very good work because he was the very first one uh, quite a long time ago, so in 1942, to uh, demonstrate that uh, animals, uh, more precisely wild rodents, they, they, can have, they can be infected by coccidoides imitis and, and all the fungal organisms. So Chester Hemmons, he made a, a very nice work with histoplasma and bats, and also a very nice uh, and uh, first work with um, coccidoides and, and rodents. And now we, we, we know that the, the, the rodents for coccidoides is something like an obligate or a very important host. And there is a, uh, something like a wait and see strategy developed by coccidoides, probably by many other dimorphic fungus, uh, fungi. And this wait and see strategy allows the fungus to persist in the small mammal host until it dies. And when the, the, the small mammal is dying, then the fungus is able to use the, the body of the small mammal and, uh, and uh, sporulate a lot. There is a strong sporulation. So it is very, um, it's very positive. It's very good option, very good strategy for the, for the fungus. So this is a new representation of the life cycle, uh, showing the, the importance of the development inside the, the living mammal with two possibilities of, of, of um, development, uh, a fast development with the dissemination, or a slow development with the development inside a, a, um, a kind of granuloma in the, in the lungs, for example. And the, 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 the end is the same when the, the mammal is dying, then the fungus is uh, using the body of the small mammal. To, to develop and to sporulate, and then there is uh, the possibility of a spread of the, um, the arthroconidia through this, uh, this uh, small mammal body. Um, another argument to say that uh, host, uh, mammal or mammalian host are very important for development of coccidoides is coming from um, comparative genomic analysis. So this is a very nice paper published a few years ago. And uh, in this paper, they compared the genome of coccidoides and a very close but non-pathogenic uh, fungus, uh, which, whose name is Ancinocarpus uh, rhizii. And what they observed when they compared the genome of these two different uh, closely related uh, fungus is that there, there are many, many differences. Uh, uh, for coccidoides, there is a decrease in genes involved in plant cell wall degradations, but a concomitant expansion in the number of genes involved in the use of animal carcasses and some type of proteases and uh, keratinases also are, are present. Uh, and, and this is a, a, a very strong argument to say that the, the, the development inside the, the mammalian host is, is more or less 
um, compulsory for the became compulsory for the fungus. So as a conclusion, you see that this uh, way of transmission uh, from this kind of reservoir combining a specific environment and a specific type of animal is probably very important. And I gave you some example with Thalaromyces, with um, Histoplasma, Coxiluides. I don't have enough time, but there are also very nice um, things to say about Emoncia-like fungi, about Paracoxiluides in South America with, with tattoos and probably many more examples. The, the two main characters, uh, the, the, the most important animals, are the, the animals who are able to burrow, uh, who are in very close contact with the soil. So this is very important, and most of them are rodents. But we have also the example of badgers, for example, in, in, in Europe, and badgers, uh, which are not rodents, they are carnivores, but they may act as reservoir for certain type of histoplasma uh, organisms in Europe. So, but the, the, the link is the, uh, the strong um, contact with, with burrows, with the soil, and also the presence of, of keratin in these burrows coming from the air of the mammals. And there is a, another important group of animals with flying animals. So I, I mentioned bats. We could also discuss about birds. Birds also uh, hacked as um, important, may act as important reservoir, but I, I focus for this uh, presentation about mammals. So flying animals, another uh, group of very important um, potential reservoir of uh, uh, pathogenic fungi. Uh, so I, I thank you very much for your attention, and I would like to take the advantage of this presentation to make two announcements. So first of all, uh, there will be, uh, just before the, the team meeting in Athens, there will be uh, uh, a small uh, meeting in Romania uh, about the, this is the International Veterinary uh, Mycology Course. We organize quite uh, frequently um, under the umbrella of Isham and the the Veterinary, Veterinary and One Health uh, Working Group. So this is the first announcement. And the second an announcement is the, the creation of a new journal whose name will be One Health Mycology. Um, and this journal will, will be launched officially in 2024. And, uh, what the, is the name I didn't get of the journal? The journal One Health Mycology. Uh, and uh, is under the umbrella of uh, Sibren de Hoog and uh, the, the foundation of Atlas of Clinical um, Fungi. Thank you very much for your attention. May I ask you something? Yes. Well, maybe that's a tricky <laughs> question, but so what would you predict will be the next, the next zoophilic human uh, major infection. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have no prediction about this. Um, <laughs> so we know what, what vaccines to prepare. <laughs> what vaccines to prepare, yes, okay. Uh, I, I, I think we should be aware about dermatophytes, um, zoophilic dermatophytes. We should may pay more attention to this kind of, of, of pathogens. Um, okay, th this is a part of my my answer. But I will transfer your me uh, your message to my colleague Professor Daniel Al Ad. Mm -hmm. You know the name. I know him very well. Yeah. Okay, so that he has a great future. <laughs> okay, thank you, Esther, and thank, thank you. you very much, uh, Jacques, for your conference. So, just looking at the chat, uh, there is a technical problem for some people uh, online, so really sorry for that. It seems that in this room, many people are using Wi-Fi, so if you can uh, stop to upload uh, uh, documents, it will be easier for the connection. And uh, most of the questions are for Professor Ahmad Fahal on the chat, so we will send him the, the question. But uh, I think we don't have him online. Isn't it? No. Okay. So, uh, what I can propose to you is now to have a break. 
thank you very much for the three uh, speakers because uh, this uh, inaugural conference is uh, um, uh, point out many many important problems and you can ask questions during the coffee break and please because we are online and online with people from different continents with different jet lags we will try to start uh, and to keep so uh, let's be here at uh, 11 what is the, yeah. the sorry 11. yes 11 yeah so have a good coffee break thank you